I think we'll go ahead and get going. Uh, for those on the presentation here, this is Steve Carson uh, from the MACAFA board. We have been interacting with a lot of fellow franchisees, like I'm sure everyone has. And it seems like every time I ask one question about the ERC credits, I, I get three, three new questions. Um, but there's also been sort of a sort of a general unawareness and a little bit of uncertainty about what we do and don't qualify for. And that's definitely tied to, I think, two things. The first thing is that all this stuff keeps changing, right? Even in preparation for this presentation, um, John Leathers from Trusaic uh, was, was still getting new information from their regulatory compliance team from a release from the IRS that just came out last week, right? So these things are constantly updating. We're gonna try and keep track of those updates and get them out to people. But having attended a number of these ERC presentations, I always find that real simple nuts and bolts stuff is missing from the presentation. And so we wanted to have a little bit more of a how-to approach for this and a little bit more of a simplified do I qualify or not discussion available so that everybody knows just how much is available. Um, we're talking about looking backwards to 2020 and looking forward to 2021. We put this together on pretty short notice because um, you know we're at the end of the first quarter and a, a lot of people are eligible for credits and maybe don't know how to file for them or don't know that they're eligible but there's still time to do it with your regular 941 filing. So we want to get this information out as quick as possible to everybody. If you have any questions during the presentation, just go ahead and type them and John will either answer those live or we'll get them out answered in writing. I know a lot of people have had specific questions that maybe they couldn't get answered in other forums. We'll do our best to answer those. Um, for this presentation, we, we partnered up with a group called Trusaic. Uh, I was referred to them from my ADP account rep to get some help with some ACA issues. And just as an example of what they do, it's kind of kind of twofold. One is they help companies with compliance issues. And then the other one is they help people to not leave money on the table. There's a wide range of, of things available that you can apply for through the government. Um, that people just are never aware that it's even there, right? So they help companies, generally larger companies with that uh, type of issue. But just as an example for 2020, uh, literally until yesterday when I was talking with John, I believed I was ineligible to file for anything in 2020 because my headcount is well over a hundred for our companies, right? It's closer to 200. And Trusaic is able to go through and count my company the way the government counts my company. And guess what? It turns out I'm eligible to file for ERC credits in 2020. That's going to be a difference of hundreds of thousands of dollars for me. Um, and it's a big deal. And all of our clinics throughout California have been through the ringer. And this is a prime time opportunity to get back to being financially healthy for a lot of us, okay? One thing that I think precludes people from taking action on this is we're so used to, um, especially as, as California business owners, anything, something comes from the government, we're used to like, what's it's gonna cost me and what do I have to do and when do I have to do it by, right? It's so rare that somebody says, here's a lot of money, all you have to do is file this paperwork and you get it. Like we were almost in disbelief. Like when they came out with the most recent legislation and said we're eligible for ERC in quarters three and four, I, like nobody talked about it. And then I got an email from Trusaic and I was like, is this right? And I forwarded it to other people. They're like, that can't be right, right? And it's almost disbelief because for our type of business, it's a lot of money and it can make a big difference. So with that, I wanna kick it over to, to John Leathers He's a VP of products for Trusaic, and he's going to take us through a kind of a high level, but real nuts and bolts blocking and tackling presentation on ERC. And then we'll take questions along the way and at the end. John? Perfect. Thanks a lot, Steve. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate the introduction and happy to be here talking about the retention credit with the folks on the line. Um, 
And yeah, I, I will say that, uh, you know, Steve, he really, he took the kind of the first pass at the, at the presentation and really, you know, we try to make it more of, hey, look, here's concrete examples of how calculations are performed without going too far into the weeds. And so hopefully that will be insightful for, for you all that are on the line. Um, and without further ado, let's, let's start to dive in here. So in terms of the, the 30,000 foot view of what we intend to cover today, um, it's, well, what is the employee retention credit and how can that benefit me for both 2020 and 2021? Uh, how do I determine whether I'm eligible? How do I claim the credit if I am eligible? Um, how do I balance the employee retention credit against the Paycheck Protection Program and, and do it in a way where I'm maximizing the financial benefit to my organization and then just overall maximize that credit? And we'll talk a little bit about how, you know, we're taking a different approach than a lot of the, the vendors out there. But all in all, our goal is just to provide some education and to uh, make sure you have information in your hands that can benefit your organizations. So uh, the employee retention credit, uh, it's really, it's a simple program that encourages employers who are affected by the pandemic to retain and compensate employees. And so it's a refundable credit against employment taxes that you're already required to pay. Um, and so if you experience a business shutdown or slowdown due to COVID, um, you know, there's a good chance that you, you can qualify for the employee retention credit. And, uh, you know, the conversation that I had with Steve that he was referencing yesterday with respect to not being aware that, you know, he qualified and, and I'll, and, you know, and Steve's one of the, frankly, you know, he's very well educated in a lot of different things. Um, but, you know, he's not alone in that boat and many employees just aren't even aware of, of what exactly is going on with the retention credit. They're, they, they've heard different things and, the reason why they've heard different things is because there has been different things. In fact, when the retention credit was first passed, um, you weren't allowed to take it and claim it if you had participated in the Paycheck Protection Program. And so the retention credit program itself has evolved you know, fairly dramatically over the last um, year. And in the last five weeks, we've had two big uh, uh, regulatory updates from the IRS providing clarification around uh, credits that can be claimed for 2020 and credits that can be claimed for 2021. And we're not done yet. The IRS has clarified that they're going to uh, shortly, we're not, we're not soon exactly when, but they will be releasing another uh, regulatory document. And um, that will provide clarification around the second half of 2021. So Hey, John, if I could jump in there real quick, um, just right out of the gate there, the refundable credit against taxes, that's one that was a subject of discussion with a lot of us. Uh, I started off being under the impression that there was only two ways to get the money. One was to you know, hold it back while you're doing payroll, but we all know that the amount of credit far exceeds the amount of taxes, right? Right. And so, so for me, it was an education just learning that the actual filing of the 941 triggers the IRS to send me a check for the amount of the credit above and beyond what I already claimed in the first quarter, right? So that part, we're so used to like a credit being against tax we already paid. This is against taxes we didn't even pay. So it's like a, like a negative credit, right? So you're gonna get a big check from the IRS if you do this right. And then the other part was uh, a lot of confusion around thinking you had to file a form 7200 in order to get a check from the IRS, but just not true, right? So it's one of these moments where it's a lot more simple than we think, but we just got to do it right, so. Yeah, that's a great point. It's, um, you're absolutely right. You can generate credit and, and receive, you know, a, a refund check for an amount that, that far surpasses your, you know, your, your payroll tax liability, so. And that is something that surprises a lot of people. Um, so thanks for, thanks for pointing that out. And so here what we have is just a simple breakdown of the, of the high, very high level dollar amounts per employee and um, qualifying criteria. And so for the calendar year 2020, we're obviously in 2021, 
um, the, the total amount that can be generated is actually smaller than 2021. Um, for 2020, you're able to generate $5,000 per employee. And um, that's against $10,000 in qualifying wages. So if, uh, you know, and that's across the whole year. So if an employee uh, accumulates or accrues you know, $10,000 in qualifying wages, they can generate up to $5,000 in credit. And so um, they're, depending on the size of the organization, and really it depends on how many full-time employees you, you have, it, it, the definition of qualifying wages is going to be slightly different. So if you had less than 100 full-time employees, and that number is actually indexed against 2019. So if you had less than 100 full-time employees in 2019, then for purposes of 2020, qualifying wages are all wages paid to employees during any time period for which you qualify for the credit. We're gonna get into, well, how do you know which time periods you qualify for in a moment? And if you have more than 100 full-time employees, then the wages that are going to be counted as qualifying wages are going to be those that were paid to furloughed employees. For 2021, the, the dollar amount that eligible per employee is dramatically larger, right? So it's $28,000 per employee, $7,000 per quarter. Um, it's, you have a cap of $10,000 in qualifying wages per quarter and employees can generate credit at a rate of 70% against that uh, you know, cap essentially. So 70% of the $10,000, $7,000 per quarter for, for a max dollar amount of 28,000 on the year for 2021. And then the full-time employee counts also side jumps up. So if you had 500 full-time or less in 2019, again, 2019 is the index year, um, you're able to claim a credit against all wages paid to employees during time periods for which you qualify for the retention credit. So on, the, on this subject, John, just some, something that probably most people know, but just good to make sure. For the wages, um, there, there've been two questions. One is do the, do the tips count, the charge tips, right? And the answer I believe is yes, because we report that on the 941. Correct. And that's essentially what our credit is being claimed against is what we're claiming on the 941 or what we're reporting that we paid the employee on the 941. So that makes a big difference in our industry. And then also when it comes to people who are paying um, em employers who are running Section 125 health benefit plans, do we get credit on the wages that um, are withheld for the 125 Yes. Yeah, that's a that's another good question. And the, and the short answer is is yes. And um, the employer and employee contributions are counted towards the dollar amount that can be, that, that is the trigger for generating credits. So, you know, the before we move on from the slide, the last thing that I'll, I'll harp home I'll, I'll harp on one more time is is what you already laid into a bit, Steve. It's it's that with respect to twenty twenty. You know, a lot of organizations, particularly, you know, if you have more than a couple of, um, if, if you if you own or manage more than a couple of massage envy locations, you know, you may think that you're over that hundred full time threshold. But it's important to remember that that's based on the Affordable Care Act's employer mandate definition of full time. And so, you know, to give you all on the line here, a ballpark sense of what those numbers typically look like for organizations that we deal with in your industry, companies that have three to 400, maybe even 500 total employees on a monthly basis, um, very commonly have, you know, anywhere from 50 to 80 ACA full-time employees. And so that ACA full-time employee definition does not necessarily, and frankly, often does not at all coincide with the organization's uh, internal perception of quote unquote full time. So just important to be aware of that because you know we've, we've come across dozens of organizations that would have left money on the table 
um, because of that m misunderstanding leading to them believing they weren't eligible for to claim a credit in 2020. And just to reiterate, I'm exactly who he's talking about. I went into the pandemic with 212 headcount. And so that when they said over 100 full-time employees, you know, I, I think, you know, of course I have that, right? But the way the government counts, it should come as a surprise to no one, is completely different than how you and I might count. And I have a ridiculously low number of full-time employees under the government's definition of ACA section 4890H, how to count people, right? So, and it's going to result in me claiming, you know, probably $300,000 of credit that I, I didn't know I could claim. Right. Yep. So moving on, um, how, how do I determine whether I'm whether I'm eligible to claim the retention credit and for what time periods I'm eligible to claim that, that, that tax credit, right? So we talked about the fact that, you know, you're potentially eligible for 2020 and 2021, but there's tests that need to be performed to determine what specific time periods within 2020 and 2021, you might be able to benefit from the retention credit. And the first test that we have on the left side here is a test that measures it checks for decline in gross receipts. And so if you experience a decline in gross receipts, when you compare calendar quarters in 2020 or 2021, and you compare those against reference calendar quarters in 2019, if you have declines in gross receipts that exceed thresholds that the IRS has laid out, then um, you will automatically qualify for those credits. And so the threshold percentages are a little different for 2020 and for 2021. For 2020, the decline in gross receipts is harder to qualify for. It needs to be at least 50% decline when you compare uh, any quarter in 2020 against its reference quarter in 2019. For 2021, it's easier to qualify. The decline in gross receipts only needs to be um, at least 20% when indexed against the reference quarter in 2019. And important to note that the test is performed on a quarter by quarter basis. And, uh, you know, Steve did mention this. It's not too late to go back and claim for 2020. Um, it can be done using Form 941X. And uh, that is the first test. A test on a quarter by quarter basis of, for, for example, quarter three of 2020. How does quarter three of 2020 compare against quarter three of 2019? And if it is at least 50% down when compared to that reference quarter, then you qualify for that entire quarter to be able to claim wages, excuse me, to be able to claim retention credit against the wages that were paid during that quarter to employees. So on this one, John, and for everybody, one of the ones I got stuck on is how do I know for quarter two of 2021 that I qualify because quarter two has not happened yet. Right. And I think you said it's called a piggyback quarter. Yeah, that's, uh, that's our own kind of internal little lingo, but essentially the, the, IR, the IRS has laid out um, like these uh, safe harbors, if you will, where, uh, you know, understanding that employers do need the, the ability to plan for looking ahead um, you are able to rely on a prior quarter as a safe harbor estimate for the future quarter, right? So we just finished quarter one, 2021. We know the gross receipts for quarter one, 2020, 20, excuse me, 2021. We don't know them for quarter two yet, but we're able to use the gross receipts for quarter one as a proxy for quarter two and use that as a baseline, uh, as a measurement to determine whether, you know, you will qualify for quarter two, even though obviously we're, we're six days into it. And then the other one on here that I found interesting was on the decline in gross receipts, look, because for 2020, if you go back, um, because of the type of business that we have with our, our dues model, we may not have experienced a 50% decline in a given quarter. However, 
if any portion of that quarter was affected by a government ordered shutdown of some, if they, if they had any limitation on our business whatsoever, we're eligible to go back and make a claim on that quarter. Is it the entire or just the dates we were affected? Under the gross receipts test, um, you are able, you qualify for the entire quarter if you qualify. You're asking about that, the gross receipts, correct? Yeah, but if we, if let's say we were down 30% in 2020, right. so we don't meet the gross receipts test, but part of that quarter, the government shut us down. And, and in our industry, we were partially shut down from December 8th to January 26th. Right. right. Yeah. So we can go back and claim wages for what portion of the quarter? Well, for the portion during which you were shut down. Yeah. Even if we don't meet the gross receipts test. That's correct. Yep. So, so typically the way that you approach this is you, you do the, you do the check for the decline in gross receipts. And then to the extent that that is not met, then you take a look like Steve is mentioning, okay, well, what period of those quarters was I fully or partially shut down? Due to, for example, you know, an order from the mayor stating that all non-essential businesses have to close or a state emergency announcement that everyone has to shelter in place. And, you know, the effect that that can clearly have on businesses and did have on businesses. Um, and I think you said that you, you yeah, you, you shut down December 8th to like January 26th, right? Um, and or I'm sorry, there, you know, you had, uh, you had, an, your operations were affected because um, appointments could only be made uh, with doctor reference, if I remember correctly, Steve. That's correct. Yeah. So either in that case or in the case that our, our gift card sales totally bombed, you know, hopefully people qualify one way or the other, but you can get something no matter what in 2020. Right. So we're going to, we're going to, you know, hit the nuts and bolts a little bit here, like what Steve was talking about. And what we have here is just an example of some gro a gross receipts test. So up here, we have our 2019 reference year. We have quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four for 2019. And we have gross receipts for each one of those quarters. And what we're doing here is we're comparing the gross receipts in quarter two of 2020 to the gross receipts in quarter two of 2019. And so when we measure, when we, when we index th these gross receipts in quarter two of 2020 against the gross receipts in 2019, we see that as a percentage of those, you know, the quarter two 2020 was only 39%. And we talked about how in 2020, the gross receipts test to meet it, you have to be less than 50%. So in this particular quarter, with these dollar amounts, the test, the percentage test was met because 39% is less than the 50% threshold. And, you know, you see that play out here for each one of the quarters where 39%, 46%, and 48% are all less than the 50% threshold required for 2020. We move into 2021, first quarter. We compare the first quarter gross receipts of 2021 against the first quarter gross receipts in 2019. We're at 76% in Q1 of 2021, and we do meet the threshold for 2021. 76% is less than the 80% threshold that the IRS has established for 2021. So this, this is an example of uh, how exactly that calculation is performed. We're going to move on to a little bit um, more uh, nuanced situation, um, but this is a very straightforward situation where, you know, the, this organization, you know, this hypothetical organization passes the gross receipts test for each quarter. Anything you wanted to add to that, Steve? Uh, no. Okay. So this next example is, is slightly different. What we can see here is that the organization in question, they passed the gross receipts percentage test for quarter two. Um, and, but then for quarter three of 2020, they're at 59% uh, indexed, the 177 against the 300,000. So although they're down and they're down significantly, they're not down far enough to meet the technical threshold. Um, now, 
you see the same thing for quarter four, but there's a, you know, we talked a little bit about a piggyback test, right? Where they don't meet the, the, the initial percentage test, but because quarter two was the first quarter that this organization qualified for the credit, they were at 39%, which is less than the 50. What happens is there's this piggyback test that takes place in 2020, where you're able to carry forward this eligibility into subsequent quarters so long as those quarters are below 80%. So although these quarters, you know, technically they, you know, they don't meet that 50% test, they're piggybacking off this first quarter, they get a more lenient threshold. And the end result is that the employer qualifies for quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. So there's these little nuances that need to be taken into account um, that, that I've also seen, you know, organizations, you know, not properly account for and believe that, you know, they were only eligible for quarter two in, in a, an example very similar to this one. Is there any, uh, anything you wanted to add to that one, Steve? No, just another great example of how we count differently than the government. Right. And exactly. in this case, it's incredibly, it's in our favor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now here we have an example where um, the employer meets the initial percentage test for 2020 quarter two. They meet the piggyback test for 2020 quarter three. But then, um, and we, won't, we don't need to get down too far into the weeds, they fail that test for quarter four and quarter one. Um, and so the next step then is to say, okay, well, we know that, they, that they, they're going to be able to generate credit for quarter two, quarter three. Can we still generate credit for quarter four of 2020 and quarter one of 2021, even though they don't meet the gross receipts test? And the way that we're going to check for that is by checking for a full or partial shutdown. Right. And so moving on, what we see here is that um, this organization, they were, in fact, they experienced a shutdown, uh, you know, government order asked from, you know, imposed on them from December to January mandated that services that be performed on an appointment only basis instead of a line walk ins resulting in a partial suspension. And so now these two quarters, you see the yes, they do qualify and qualifying wages paid during the, during the shutdown that lasted from December to January will be able to be used to generate credits for, for this organization. And so the analysis of full versus per, partial you know, suspension, you know, it just involves looking at the organization's facts and circumstances. What's the documentation available to substantiate those facts and circumstances? And you know, tying that to the uh, IRS notice 2021 uh, that came out uh, roughly five weeks ago and just making sure that, you know, we feel comfortable and confident to be able to attest in the event that we're asked to substantiate that, um, that, you know, we, we pass muster, that we pass the threshold of being able to claim, in, in this case, what would be a partial shutdown. Um, We'd, we'd, we'd alluded to this earlier. The, the point of this page here is just that this is still very much uh, an involving landscape. The IRS, again, has not yet even issued out their final clarifying documents with respect to quarter three and quarter four of 2021. We do have a, a very good sense of uh, you know, how to claim the credit for 2020 and for the first two quarters of this year, so Jan through June. But again, we're, we are waiting on guidance for Q3 and Q4. That said, <clears throat> we, we spoke about this a few minutes ago. The IRS has put forth, you know, what is in effect a safe harbor that allows employers to determine um, for a particular quarter um, whether they qualify based on a prior quarter, right? And so again, for quarter two, 2021, I'm actually able to, to use my quarter one gross receipts as a proxy and to run my gross receipts check using that dollar amount for quarter one um, because, you know, it's, it's, in, it's to the benefit of employers to be able to, to forecast and plan ahead. And they wouldn't be able to do that without the safe harbor. So 
in terms of you know in terms of claiming the employee retention credit right, what are what are the different ways that that can be done and so there's there's really just you know there's a few simple ways that can be done the first is by using by claiming on the form 941 the the retention credit that is due and filing that on time you know typically electronically uh, obviously um and just making sure that that is already included. And so obviously if, if you know, we were trying to claim credit for 2020, that's no longer an option. For 2020, looking back, we would need to amend um, using 941X, amend and, and claim the credit for prior periods and make adjustments to what was previously filed. Now, there is, you know, in addition, you, you are able to also for prospective time periods, you can re, you're able to reduce the deposits, right? Um, and uh, in addition to that, you're also able to request an advance of the amount of the credit that you expect um, will exceed that federal employment tax deposit. And you're able to do that using Form 7200. And so here we have an example of an employer. Uh, and this actually comes straight from the IRS uh, notice that was published on March 1st. Um, you know, employer paid $20,000 in qualified wages to employees, and they're entitled to a credit of $10,000 um, with respect to those employees. They are, generally speaking, required to deposit $8,000 in federal employment taxes on wages paid to all their employees. And because they know that they're going to be able to claim this credit of $10,000, they can keep the entire $8,000 that they would have otherwise been required to deposit without penalty um, and uh, then claim that on the 941, right? So they're, act, they're kind of acting proactively, prospectively here and, um, you know, reducing th those contributions as they uh, kind of look out and say, hey, look, we, you know, we, we, confidently believe we're going to be able to claim credit for $10,000 um, that exceeds the $8,000 liability. And not only are we going to not deposit the, those taxes, we're going to request an advance payment of the credit for the remaining $2,000, the net difference between the $10,000 in credit that they know they're going to be able to generate and the $8,000 um, that they're not going to even deposit. So, April 30th though, right? That's the, that's the big looming deadline end of this month um, to be able to get the quarter one 2021 retention credit submitted with that original filing. It is, it is the ideal situation to get the retention credit submitted with the form 941 and not have to submit an amendment um, just because of the speed of the, uh, the speed of the, uh, you know, the refund is, is just, you know, likely to be much quicker um, when filed uh, with that original 941 as opposed to as an amendment. Yeah, the, the, the reason we threw this together quickly is because there's still a window of opportunity for people if you contact your payroll company to, to make a claim on your 941 before it gets filed. Then it's just all within the confines of whatever your payroll arrangement is with your, your payroll provider, right? When I started asking questions about filing for prior quarters, you know, it starts to add up pretty quickly what they charge you to do it, especially depending on head counts and all that stuff. And again, it's, it's by payroll provider, but fastest, easiest, best thing, get it on the 941. And the quote I got from our uh, payroll provider is roughly two to three weeks after you file your return, you're gonna get a paper check in your mailbox, whatever address is on the 941, you're gonna get a paper check for however many thousands of dollars you're gonna get. Yep. So that's, uh, I mean, that's pretty serious benefit, obviously. Okay. In terms, so, Let's talk a little bit about the interplay between the retention credit and the Paycheck Protection Program. So, you know, again, I think by this point, most people are beginning to be, become aware that you are allowed to claim both, um, but you just can't double dip with respect to qualified wages. Yeah. 
So go ahead, Steve. Yeah. Hey, I just, you know, I, I, I forgot the thing that struck me about the 941. I kept, I kept asking, you know, we, as business owners in California, we almost have like a Pavlovian response to this. You know, the, the payroll provider was telling me, we just put the number on the form and then they're going to send you a check. I said, okay, but what do I have to do? And they said, well, you just put the number on the form and we're going to file it and they're going to send you a check. I said, yeah, well, I get that. But I mean, what's the catch? <laughs> you know, because it just seems too good to be true. But literally, that is it. You're going to show an overage of what you're owed for the credit. And then you're going to get the difference in the form of a check. That's what refundable credit means. I, I literally thought, when I started reading about ERC, that I was going to claim credits every payroll. And when I modeled it out, I was going to collect credits until like 2026, okay, in order to get everything back that was owed. So it's, it's this simple, but there's a time constraint. And if you haven't gotten that in play already, there's time to do it before you file this quarter's 941. But certainly for next quarter, you can plan that out. Exactly. And so, um, yeah, again, you know, you just can't use the same wages to qualify for forgiveness of the PPP loan and, and, you, and use those wages for retention credit qualified wages. Um, if you have wages left over, uh, you can treat those remaining wages as employee retention, wages left over from PPP, you, you know, you, you use those as a retention credit eligible wages subject to that max upper limit of the $10,000 per employee per quarter in 2021. And so, you know, one thing that, um, you know, employers should certainly be aware of is the, you know, the option to use to your advantage non-payroll costs for paycheck protection program forgiveness to maximize the wages that are available for the retention credit. And here is actually an example of what not to do, right? So in this particular example, the employer received a loan for $200,000. They used that loan um, and they paid $200,000 of qualified wages to employees. They also actually paid other eligible expenses um, in the form of rent utility supplier costs of $70,000. When they submitted their loan forgiveness application, they reported the $200,000 of qualified wages, but they didn't report the other eligible expenses, um, you know, likely because it was just simpler to not do so. Um, but that had some pretty big implications. Uh, had they reported that $70,000, they would have um, been able to essentially, you know, use that to, to their advantage to generate retention credit. But because they did not, um, they lost out on the opportunity to, to generate um, credit, you know, using that, that net amount. And so, you know, definitely worth it to, you know, take the, the little bit more extra time, make sure you've done the proper accounting and on that forgiveness application, list out the non-payroll, the, all the other eligible expenses, um, because it's, it's going to have a dramatic uh, impact on the amount of retention credit that you're potentially able to generate. Let's see. Okay. So, you know, in terms of uh, retaining documentation, you know, one thing to note is that the IRS did extend the statute of limitations from three years to five years. Um, it is important for employers to, uh, you know, take seriously the documentation component of this project and, um, you know, to, to, to make sure that you have uh, ready, right, to substantiate positions that are taken in terms of qualifying reasons. So that includes, um, you know, things like the, you know, the, the gross receipts and the, uh, you know, the, the extent to which the organization was under any kind of a shutdown. Um, if it, you know, sometimes it's not a cut and dry case, right? A lot of times, particularly when, you, when you're claiming a partial shutdown, um, there's, there's 102 pages on the notice that was issued on March 1st for a reason. 
Um, and it's because there's just a lot of different complex situations and um, it's important to have your ducks in a row and make sure that, you know, if someone comes knocking, you are, you know, you feel comfortable and confident to substantiate the, the position that you've taken. Uh, employee count calculations are important, uh, right? Because they directly influence which bucket you fall into. And so properly determining the full-time counts, um, uh, using that ACA methodology uh, are critical, um, maintaining documentation of that and how that number was calculated. Additionally, um, you know, when you're performing the calculation of which employees qualify and for how much and, you know, how, mu how much in wage and, you know, um, were health expenses taken into account there, all that documentation of the methodology used to perform the calculations. Um, and then, you know, for PPP borrowers, we've hit this already, but, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, you, you have clear, good, strong documentation around how you're avoiding uh, double dipping on, uh, you know, between those, uh, between the two programs. So uh, anything to add here, Steve, before I keep uh, moving? No, I don't, I don't think so. The, um, the thing, the thing again on here, I, I keep saying it, but the, for, for people who own multiple units and think that you're over a hundred employees, very good chance you're not. And that affects going back into 2020. Um, and then the, the one that's been a big topic of discussion for all of us is, is PPP and, and segmenting that out. And if you think about it, um, basically for every, every $10,000 that you don't claim on PPP, cause, cause last year you could only do PPP or ERC, right? So it was a little bit different this year, it's totally in our interest to liquidate non-PPP expenses like rent and, and utilities and whatnot and shift gears into ERC because for every 10,000 bucks that you don't claim in ERC credits that are available, right? It's $7,000 that you could have. So it's, it's a big deal. And it's the way I look at it, the government has volunteered to pay 70% of our wages for the entire year, except for the number of weeks it takes us to use PPP if you have it. I, I figure that's 80% and we should all make sure that we get it. That's it. Yeah, that's great, great points. Um, you, you know, in terms of just laying out like, pro, you know, what do the process steps look like for, for a project, right? Um, you know, first, what we do is we assess the aggregated groupings, uh, like what Steve was, you know, was just talking about. So, you know, to the extent that there's different employer identification, you know, EINs um, with common ownership or that are providing services jointly or to or for or uh, each other, that all needs to be analyzed to, you know, and to identify and document whether there's parent subsidiary control groups, any brother sister control groups, any affiliated service groups, any management groups, all of that stuff needs to be documented up front. Um, and then once you've done that, that sets the baseline, the foundation for properly determining the credit, properly determining the full-time counts because the full-time counts are uh, based on you know, the group. Um, and then once you've done that, you know, you're, you're able to move on and say, okay, I have my foundation right. What is my you know, eligibility for the different time periods of 2020 based on the two tests that we talked about, the gross receipts tests or the suspension you know, due to a COVID, government COVID order. Uh, once you understand the time periods for which you qualify, now you're in a position to identify the employees um, within those time periods and uh, you know, take a look at the wages, get that data, document information, gather it and um, you consolidate and, and perform the calculations um, for the quarters um, that are applicable and the time periods that are applicable. You know, prepare the forms to, to be able to claim the refund. Um, make sure that, you know, you have that documentation in the event that you, you're asked to substantiate the position you've taken and then, you know, get the, actually get the retention credit refund from the IRS. 
one of the one of the questions on here that that came up had to do with um, what kind of things could qualify for the for the partial shutdown. And so one of those was capacity restrictions. And depending on which county you were in, the county might have said you can be at 25% of your capacity, right? So that's a severe limitation on our type of business. Would that restriction, if it was in place the entire quarter, make all wages for the quarter eligible? It could potentially. Yeah. And I, I don't want to, um, you know, make any kind of like a broad, uh, uh, proclamation on the call, but it absolutely could. Um, you know, obviously you want to look at each organization specifically, you know, every, everyone is unique, but that is listed directly in the, uh, in, in notice 2021-03 um, as one of the factors that needs to be taken into account. It goes beyond that. You know, you need to, you need to meet, um, you know, a definition of what's called nominal impact. And uh, that itself is a facts and circumstances analysis, but that absolutely is, a, it would be a strong factor um, weighing in, in favor of being able to claim the credit, you know, for that whole quarter, should the organization not already qualify using the gross receipts test. Okay. So I think we're gonna move to answering some more of these questions. Um, you know, Trusaic has offered, they'll, they'll Anybody who's interested can can set up a free consultation with them to kind of go through the broad sketches of your specific circumstances, and then they're they're arranging discount pricing available for um, MCAFA members to go back and file. As I said before, with with respect to ADP, there's a there's a cost to uh, that's I'll speak only to that because that's my payroll provider. There's a cost for me to go back in time and start filing. Um, you know, refiling 941s. Um, but on the ADP side, you know, one of the things I was surprised at in the first quarter was that they, they just let you throw a number down and submit a batch to them. And that's the number they, they go with. So whatever you tell them, they say, okay. And they put it and I, I played it pretty safe. Um, I didn't really get too far into like health expenses and stuff. I just kind of stuck with gross wages, 941. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty safe way to go. But what Trusaic offers is sort of that plus a few more layers of um, making sure it's going to be right. You know, the, the way I got introduced to Trusaic is that I got a letter from the IRS saying, we think you were a applicable large employer for a certain year. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And, and so ADP couldn't help me. They got me to Trusaic. Trusaic did it. I, I thought 100%, I'm going to be completely screwed. And everybody's read what some of the penalties are for ACA stuff. And it turns out I'm not even close to being completely screwed because I don't know how to count the way the government counts, but Trusaic does. So that was how I ended up with them. And I imagine there's some value for, for some of the people on this call. And so if that's somebody that... Uh, you think can help, I think it's a good resource. But with that, let's get into some of these questions. I've got um, a couple that came in on the chat box. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read those. Uh, yeah, it's, so, so while, you, while you pull those up too, I, I'll note that um, what we are gonna do is we're gonna collect every question and we will send out answers to every question um, that, that gets you know, uh, submitted here. And uh, I will do, I'll answer the ones that I can here. Um, but ultimately, you know, we're going to have our, our compliance team um, take, a, take a look at those and make sure that we get accurate answers for, for the folks that are on the line and get those circulated out. So one of them that's probably pretty common to a lot of people, what are the guidelines about paying myself? I'm a managing partner with 50% ownership. Yeah, that one's a, that one's a common one. Um, so... It, it, Part of it is the, the, um, the, the entity structure, but like, for example, for an S corporation, um, you know, owners with less than 50% ownership um, should be able to claim, uh, you know, the credit against their own wages. Um, owners with greater than that 50% mark, and remember, you have to take into account attribution, direct and indirect, um, you know, performing a proper, you know, parent, subsidiary, brother, sister kind of analysis. 
um, across the entities and across the owners. Um, but it, it just depends on the, the, the entity structure and the uh, ownership percentages. So single, de- single entity, 50% owner, pay themselves salary. Can they go ahead and claim that credit? Single location. They, probably. I believe they should be able to claim the credit if it's at 50%. It's not greater than 50%, right? So Okay, so greater than 50 is the key thing. I, I believe so, yeah. But And again, uh, we will we will get hard answers out to, to all of these things here. But okay. I it, yeah. Um, I, we had a couple of questions kind of like that. So I'm sure you guys will get that. Um, do successor businesses qualify for ERC in cases of asset sale and all business assets and operations were required? So if you bought somebody's business during COVID, can you go back and claim uh, ERC credits based on the my understanding, based on the reading of uh, you know the, the recent notice documents that were submitted, is that yes, and the, the IRS has laid out uh, some pretty specific rules and methodology around how that should be done. Um, but the short answer is is that uh, uh, you know yes, it should it should be able to be done. Um, face masks, disinfectants, gloves, et cetera, being con- considered part of medical benefits can be used as part of wages. Is that a, so similar to how you're claiming um, Section 125 costs, um, anything that you're using for personal protective equipment, is that something that can be included? I, I believe that it, it, it should be able to be included. I believe that it should be, um, and yeah, I, I think that that is accurate. Okay, mm-hmm. maybe that's another one we'll, we'll we'll get in writing and just verify. Yeah, all of these uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna get in writing absolutely. Yeah, so a couple couple nuts and bolts thing. If someone has an accountant already engaged in doing taxes, can Trusaic do an ERC filing for them? Um, so, you know, what we do is we, we prepare the forms, we, we do all the analytics and the documentation, the audit ready package, um, and get it to that point where, where, you know, the filing can be performed. Um, we're generally speaking, not actually doing the, the filing, uh, ourselves. We're just getting it to that point where it can just be kind of tapped in the end zone, if you will. Um, this one I know the answer to, but do we give payroll company access to Trusaic and they handle everything from there? That was my experience with ACA. Is that Correct. accurate? Yeah, it, absolutely. Yep. That's, that's the idea is that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of complexity just even methodologically. And so, um, you know, you add the data piece on there and getting the right data from the right fields and pulling it all together that's just part of the differentiated value that that we're looking that we that we do provide you know across all of our products and services um and i know that's been your experience steve i i think it'd be fair to categorize this as the ronco um if anybody's seen that infomercial the ronco cooker set it and forget it thing (laughs) pretty much i had like a one hour opening meeting with my rep from Trusaic. And then the next thing I know, I'm, I'm in a portal and it's got all my everything in there. And the only thing I had to do really was get them the access um, to do the work. And, and once they were in there, they just, they pulled everything. Same thing with my, uh, I gave them access to my uh, um, health insurance provider. Yep. I actually only just like told them the name and they got in there and, and found all my stuff, so. Yeah. I mean, we, over, you know, we, we have a lot of, um, we, we work extensively with just about every major and even minor and, and regional uh, payroll, Ben admin, uh, you know, HRIS systems, um, just as a function of, of the, the different products and services that we provided over into the last 20 years. So, yeah, just a, uh... Just to add to it, because it, it, you know, Trusay operates in a, a kind of a number of spaces, I guess. But I'll, I'll remember at the tail end of like my initial consultation, they they said, "Were you open in 2016?" I said, "Well, yeah." And they said, "Did you claim? Did you already claim your um, 
employment disaster area credits for 2016. <laughs> I was like, I don't even know what that is. They said, oh, you can claim, you know, X percent of all the wages you paid because your Orange County was declared a disaster area in 2016, right? Right. So we're, we're talking about that kind of stuff. Like there, there's credits that none of us ever know will exist. It reminds me of the TV commercial with the guy who wore the jacket with all the question marks on it. This is like a whole company of those people, okay? So anyhow, I, I would encourage everyone to do a free consult um, and, and see if there's areas because really it's just it's just found money, right? If, if somebody came and said, I'm, I'm going to give you a check for $10,000, as long as you give me back a check for $1,500, you would say, what's the catch? No catch. <laughs> you say, okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll take that trade every day. <laughs> so, do I have to do anything? Uh, not really. So, yeah. okay. If there's any other questions, um, Feel free to, to email those in. I'm gonna try and refresh the questions. I think I, so how much are Trusaic fees? They're, they're, they, uh, my understanding is everything's on contingency, but we are talking about trying to put together a special deal for this because our so much of our payroll qualifies um, for this. We wanna try and make sure that Trusaic's compensated for their work, but also that we have, uh, uh, the opportunity to competitively keep as much of our benefit as possible. Yep, absolutely. So we'll, we'll put that out. Yep, certainly will. And uh, no, just thanks, thanks a lot. And hopefully this was helpful to everyone. I know we're at 1058 here um, and we'll, we'll collect all the questions that were submitted and we will get answers circulated out to, to all the participants and including the um, the presentation PDF, uh, Steve, you know, you'll have that to be able to circulate to whoever you'd like to. Yeah. So. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get the questions answered and out. The presentation we'll be able to send out. Hopefully this raised awareness on, on some of the key points. Again, the, the motivating factor for this was we'd seen so many people asking questions or being surprised by how simple some of this was that we felt it was important to get out and, Try and uh, try and answer some questions and get get finish line before Q1 filings are done. That's kind of a key thing. Yep. Uh, so, can you provide some con info for your company, or for you, or is it on the presentation somewhere? Uh, contact info. You're saying, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. All right. Yep. So yeah, it'll be in the presentation when we send it out. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, thanks. Right. Thanks so much, Steve and, and everyone for, for your time today and uh, you know, looking forward to being able to be a resource to, to you all. Great. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye now.